It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome to the program. What a delight to hang with you. Has to take. I got to take my mind off of all of the craziness in the universe. Shut down, not shut down. Shut down, not shut down. That was the quickest non-shutdown there ever was. I got a bunch of calls and uh, emails wondering why we actually did not see the stock market sell off in advance of the shutdown. And the reason is simple. That is, uh, if you look back to shutdowns, hasn't been so bad for markets, for stock markets. It's funny, right? You would think, oh, it's a terrible, nah. It's the debt ceiling that investors care about. They don't care as much about these shutdowns. 18, before this one, 18 shutdowns in the last uh, 40 years or so. On average, the S&P 500 gone down uh, six-tenths of 1%. And uh, the last three shutdowns, the market actually went up. In 2013, the S&P 500 was uh, up by 3.1% during the shutdown. So... Anyway, uh, you don't have to worry too much about any of that because uh, hopefully it's over for at least the time being till we get to that next deadline. Then we'll talk about it again. If you've got a financial question, give us a holler. 855-411-JILL. 855-411-JILL. Or send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Let's go and take a call. It's Campbell on the line from South Carolina. Hello, Campbell. What can I do for you? Hi, Jill. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. What's up? Uh, so I have been working out of college and working about a year and a half, and I feel like I've reached my goals for my eight-month emergency fund, and I've started doing a little bit of just general investing in a portfolio, and I'm thinking it's probably about time to start thinking about saving for a down payment on a home eventually. Uh, that's something that's further down the horizon, but I wanted to see if that was a good idea to start saving for that, and if so... Uh, the best way to do that, because I've seen a lot of conflicting information about Mm. how to go about that properly. Okay. So, Campbell, uh, how old are you? You're like 25 or something? 25. Uh Uh-huh. And are you working? I'm working, yes. How much do you make? 48,000 a year. Do you work for a company that uh, actually offers a retirement plan? Yes. What kind? 401k? Uh, I have a 401k, and they match half a percent up to 8%, so essentially match 4%. Okay, and how much are you contributing to the 401k? 11%. Okay, and so far so good, right? So you, you'd be able to do 11%, no problem to your cash flow. You've got your emergency reserve fund, right? Everything's good, that yeah. sounds like. Okay, great. Um, and how much money do you say you have in a outside of the 401k? So 401k, I have about 9,000. Um, and then in just a general savings account, I have about 14,000. And I also have a uh, one-year certificate of deposit with another 9,000 uh, in it. Oh, okay. So 9,000 in a CD and then 14,000 in other stuff. And now the question is about a house. Mm. Correct. How much is your rent right now? Uh, 825. Mark and I are shaking our heads. We've got to leave New York. Yeah, it's a hey, it's South Carolina that you can't beat the cost of living. So, okay, but here's a good question for you. You're 25 years old. Um, do, are you sure you want to lock yourself down to th- even thinking about a house right now? I guess th- that uh, is part of the question. I guess um, is that if it's not necessarily saving for a house, should I still be putting aside money? safely whether it's for my next car or something like that yeah i I mean yeah i mean look so there's a few things when i think about like just general financial planning i always go short intermediate long term right Mm -hmm. and on the short term you've got the emergency reserve fund hey if i get you know booted out of my job could i support myself and you said you had eight months in that emergency reserve fund plus you've got a nine thousand dollar cd that's floating around so that's kind of great um so i think you're covered there For the long term, that's the 401k, right? And, you know, if you could put the max in, that would be fine. But I get the idea for having a need for some liquidity. And the liquidity would be in the intermediate term. 
And that's the harder, I think that's the hardest way to save because the intermediate term is, is kind of like anywhere from two to five years. And right. so in the next two to five years, will you need a new car? Yes, no, maybe, right? And then you have to start saving and potentially investing for that. So what I always say is whatever you know you need in the next year, that's what you have in cash. Beyond right. that, you can start to play around a little bit, but it still should be a portfolio that would be less risky than your 401k, right? Because you know you're going to need to access the money. And right. that would be, if, if we just call that your general investing account, what I would say is that, that that's the place where you would start accumulating money for things like a home down payment, whether a, a car, and it could even be to say, hey, you know what, I, I, I've got to go back to grad school and I need to have some money set aside to do that. Not that I'm telling you to do that. Mark's shaking his head already with the grad school. Um, but I'm just, th- th- but that's the kind of, those are the kinds of goals that you would fund in the, this sort of intermediate general investment account. And, right. and again, I think that that's a really good idea for you. I mean, if you... If you really are dying to buy a home, what you should start to look at is what would it cost me to be in a house that I'd want to own in the next few years, right? Do I want to be in a three-bedroom house with, you know, some room or do I say, eh, I don't really know what I want, where I want to do that, but I'll just put in the slush fund and start figuring out later when, you know, if, if I maybe meet somebody and I want to buy a house with somebody, if I want to do it myself, if I want to preserve the option to move to another market, to move to a different place, well, you know, I would do that having this slush fund. So I think that is a very good idea. I think that considering that you have no debt, you've got the emergency reserve fund, it makes a lot of sense to start building up these assets. And, you know, listen, if it if it's like all of a sudden in a year from now, instead of making 48 grand, you're making 58 grand, um, that that would also argue to start nudging up your 401k contribution as well. So I think that ideally we want you to max out your 401k to whatever, you know, maybe we get you to 15% in the next, you know, step up and start funding Mm -hmm. that general investment account. But remember, again, that general investment account should be less risky than your 401k. Okay. Got it. Makes sense? That all makes sense. All right. Don't buy a house just yet. Leave your, leave your options open. You're 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 uh, eight twenty five a month. I want to move in with you. I want to pay. I uh, listen. I'll 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 take the small room. I'll pay four hundred a month. How's that? Uh, hey, Greenville, South Carolina. It's a hidden gem. Come check it out. All right. I've never been to South Carolina, but now you're the second person who told me it's a great place to live. So I at least I should go visit. For goodness sakes. Thank you so much for calling, Campbell. Uh, by the way, if I were to pay four hundred dollars a month in rent in Greenville, South Carolina, that would be cheaper than the cost of my garage in New York City which is all of a sudden, it used to be cheap. I used to feel like I had the best deal in town. And I, I all of a sudden I looked at my bill. I'm like, how do I, I'm paying 430 a month. What do you pay for your um, garage? It's something stupid and cheap. I can't remember. Mark pays under $200. By the way, Mark got a good deal in a garage, which is why he bought a car. So that's a little bit weird also. Okay. You're listening to Jill on Money. 855-411-JILL. Send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. If you've missed any part of the show or want to check out a past show, go to JillOnMoney.com for more great personal finance content. You're back with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Our phone number is 855-411-JILL, but Mark prefers that you email him. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Right now, we are speaking to Alan... From the Big D, Dallas, KRLD Radio. Hi, Alan. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Oh, it's great to hear a nice Texan voice. Tell me what's on your mind. Well, Jill, I'm uh, wondering how best to fund my kids' 529 plan. Um, they will be attending private school here in the future. Uh, and I'm wondering how to fund that to 
maybe take advantage of the new uh, $10,000 um, withdrawal I can make from the 529s, but you know, most importantly, still be able to have it funded to pay for their college mm. uh, if and when they decide to go. Cool. Uh, tell me a little bit um, more information. How old are the kids right now? Um, my daughter is three and my son is eight months old. Oh, my gosh. You are on it, man. Um, <laughs> and uh how about like just a big picture about what's going on in your own financial life? But how old are you? I'm 37. Are you married? Yes, I am. And how old is your spouse? She is 35. Okay. Are you both working? We do. We are both working. And what's approximately your household income? Uh, like 400. Okay. I'd say. That's uh, you doing okay there in Texas on 400. I mean, I know the property uh, prices have gone up, and like everyone from California is moving out of state, coming to Dallas, and pushing up the prices. Well, I will tell you, buying a new house for a, you know, we had to find a new bed. So, mm-hmm. um, but uh, you know, it's we're pretty fortunate. You oh. know. And are you guys maxing out your retirement accounts right now? We are. Okay. And how much have you saved already for retirement? Um, so I've got, um, you know, my I. I Switched jobs a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. I've got about two eighty in a Roth IRA that I rolled over, and about sixty in my current traditional four hundred one k at my job. Okay. My wife has about three hundred or so mm-hmm. in her um, retirement accounts. About two hundred in a Roth and a hundred in a traditional. Great. That's awesome. Uh, how about non-retirement? Do you have a little slush fund, a little an emergency reserve? We do. We've got uh, you know money in a savings account, um, and then we also have about like forty or so in a traditional in just a taxable brokerage account. And that taxable account, what's that invested in? Is that just some stuff, or is it? it it's just a. It's a. It's a blended mutual fund at American Funds. Okay. And are you guys managing your own money, or are you working with an advisor or a broker? Well, we're working with a broker on that, but we sort of, when we bought the new house, we renovated it, and we sort of used a lot of that taxable account to finance the the, the reno. Do you so know we, what um, my friend, the contractor, told me are the four most expensive words in the English language, speaking uh, of a renovation? Uh, full house renovation. How about while we're at it? Because yeah. while you're in the middle of it, every gosh darn contractor says, well, while we're at it, you might want to blankety blank blank, fill in the blank. And then all of a sudden, well, that's what happens, right? I will freely admit to you, mm. we spent a little bit more than we thought we would. Um, but our plan was that we'd be in this house for 20 years. And, yeah, I get uh, that. We love it. All right, that's awesome. Um, so, I mean, how much are you thinking about putting into 529 plans? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I my goal was to have, uh, you know, enough to cover a, a big chunk of wherever my kids wanted to go to school. Oh, aren't you benevolent? Um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if it's, if I, you know, it, being very fortunate, I'd love to give my kids lots of options. Okay. So, um, you know, I'd. I don't know how much I should put in it, really. I mean, I, I, my goal is to have maybe 250 in each of them by the time they graduated from high school. Okay. That seems reasonable. I mean, look, you got a lot of money. And would you say that now that the house is done, once you've saved for retirement, you maxed out retirement, do you, have a, do you feel like now you have some cash flow available to fund these 529 plans? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. You know, I, I think there'd be some that I would put in a sort of in a, in a, in a taxable account. And some that I would put in the 529s. It's just a matter of how much do I put in each. I don't want to put all of it in a 529 and lose the flexibility to use that money if something were to happen. Or... Yeah, I get you. Um, what do you figure your free cash flow is? Like how much money do you think you have available either on a monthly or an annual basis to fund other stuff after the it's, after you pay for everything? It's probably like 80 or 90 okay. maybe. All right. So the way I'm thinking about this is, um, oh wait, last question. Um, on that taxable account, that forty grand that's in there, do you have any losses in there? No, we harvested 
most of those mm. to okay. when we took money out to pay for the house. Okay. Was about, that was about a year and a half ago. Okay. All right. Understood. So I think that, you know, a good game plan for you. First of all, what I would do is I would run through a few calculators just to see kind of where you stand. Um, just for college stuff and also for retirement, you know, like you can run a retirement calculation almost anywhere. OK, uh, but it seems to me you're going to be on track because you're saving a lot of money and you save beyond your retirement accounts. So maybe what the right allocation is, if you had eighty thousand dollars, you know, left over in a given year, that maybe you could take, uh, you know, 14 grand each for each kid with times two. Right. So mm-hmm. it's twenty eight grand and um, per kid because you're married. And maybe mm-hmm. in the first few years, what I might do is I would put that full amount in to each of the kids accounts to get rocking and rolling and have that really beautiful tax benefit work for you. So I would probably kind of do the overfunding in the first few years because they're really young. And then you can kind of wait and see and retest it and see where things stand. Um, And that probably, if you did that for a bunch of years, that would be great. And then maybe by the time they're going to private high school, if you've overfunded, um, and not overfunded, if you've got enough money in there, maybe you say, oh, I'll use the $10,000 a year for private high school. But, you know, probably what's going to be more, depending on where they go, right? Because if they go to UT Austin, the price tag (laughs) might be lower, right? Go, hook 'em horns is right. I love that place. I really wanted my niece to go there. She went to Vanderbilt instead. Um, I loved it. I loved it. Yeah, I mean that. So I mean that would be. So I think that you you jumpstart it for the next. You know, let's say three to five years. You put in twenty eight grand per kid. You get that rock and roll, and you save the rest of it in the brokerage account. Just be careful about that brokerage account because obviously, you know, that's subject to taxation. And mm-hmm. so um, that's one of the reasons why I have no – I think that you should almost overfund the 529 plans right now because there won't be any tax liability with the money that's in that account. Absolutely. Right? And then, you know, what? then I think we see where we are. I mean, by the way, the Texas College Savings Plan is amazing. I put, just pulled it up. There's great choices. It's very cheap. And it's, you know, basically a bunch of wonderful index funds. So um, I think you've got a good game plan. Put some money in there for the kids. For everyone else listening, you can put $14,000 per kid. But because they're married, because Alan and his wife are married, they can do 28000 per kid times two. That's, you know, 56000 Put the money in there for the first, you know, let's at least say three years. Let's see where you stand. And let's see. Um, I don't know how quickly it takes you to figure out whether your kid's going to be a good student or not. But <laughs> you might find out eight years from now that, you know, your your daughter is... Uh, a world class. What are we going to make her? A uh, world class basketball player, and maybe she'll get a scholarship. So maybe you stop funding for her at some point. So I think that's a good game plan, Alan. And uh, I certainly wish you the best of luck. And thank you so much for calling. And when we come down to Dallas, we're going to visit you and see what your new house all looks like. Pretty good, huh? Uh, That's a great question. I think that it's a very smart thing to remember that, you know, the changes in the tax law on the 529 plans mean that means that you parents can actually access this money. Right. And uh, send them to private school. Ten grand a year helps out. You're listening to Jill on money. If you've got a financial question, 855-411-JILL or conversely and preferably send us an email. Ask Jill at Jill on We'll be right back. If you've missed any part of the show or want to check out a past show, go to JillOnMoney.com for more great personal finance content. You're back with Jill on Money. This is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. We, You know what else we do? We take the mystery out of the economy about business stories that are going on. When there's a big data breach, we tell you what to do. We get on the best guests. We, we kind of do it all. All right, we don't do it all. I don't do fashion. Uh, what else don't we do? We do a little pop culture that's woven in here and there. Did you watch the end of the crown? 
Oh, my God. What are you waiting for? What are you doing with your time if you're not finishing the crown? Oh, you got all the screeners? Yeah, I'll talk to you after. We'll do some business. I got to get them before your mother does. She sits on those forever. Uh, Okay, if you've got a financial question, 855-411-JILL. Send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. And by the way, check out our website, JillOnMoney.com. You can find past shows and you can listen to this show, earlier parts of this show. You can also see videos, all sorts of fun stuff Mark's put up there. All right, let's go take a call. It is Lisa from Washington State. Hello, Lisa. Welcome to the program. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Great. What's on your mind? Well, we, um, my husband and I spent four years taking care of my parents, um, sold our house, moved everything here, and um, they both passed away last year, unfortunately. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it was a long year. Oh, um, gosh. So now we're living in their house but getting ready to sell it, and our biggest question is whether we should spend cash for a home or if we should try to get a loan for another home. Hmm. Okay. Like, so are you guys retired now? Well, we basically kind of had to at that point in time because it was a two-person job to take care of my parents. Uh-huh. So um, my husband took Social Security early. Okay. And so that really has been the only income that we've had since we started this process. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so let's let's get down. Let's drill down and do some numbers. So Social Security is the only monthly income. How much is that right now? 1400 Okay. And you have not drawn Social Security? No, I have not. Okay. And um, right, are you the sole heir to your parents' estate? No, there's three of us. Do you get any um, bonus for taking care of them? <laughs> we're hoping so, <laughs> but that's I mean, not in the legal paperwork. It isn't? Uh, no. You know what's funny about that? I mean, I laugh, but that I think that that's something that people should think about. In yeah. that, I think that it's not fair that you guys, not fair, but, I mean, you gave up a ton to take care of your parents financially and um, emotionally. And I actually think that you do deserve more from this estate. So that's just my two cents. Um, <laughs> tell me about what, how much money you have right now in terms of money in the bank. Right now, there is, we have about... 600000 in investments, and of that, probably, let's see, about 200000 of that is an inherited IRA, mm-hmm. and then another twenty of that is a Roth IRA. Okay. Got it. And then we will get probably 200000 225 from the sale of the home. Okay. In cash. Okay. So how much money do you need to live on? Well, that's a very big question. (laughs) Excuse me, not very much at this point. I mean, it's basically just going to be utilities um, and, uh, you know, the cost of owning a home, the taxes and that sort of thing. Sure. Um, And, you know, depending on where we move to, I mean, we could work again as well. I mean, that's... Do you want to do that? I mean, it's just, I mean, I I don't ask that like in a... um... That's not a judgy question. I'm just saying, do you want to work? Is that something you would like to do, resume working? Oh, not necessarily. Okay. But I mean, would if I had to. Okay. So. I got gotcha. you. Um, so if if you're looking at – so are you open to where you actually reside? Is there a big geographic you know, range of where you could live? Or, or is it just like, oh, we want to live in this particular place? No, I mean, we can, we're can. we thinking of actually moving to eastern Washington. We're in western Washington now. We're thinking of moving to eastern Washington simply because the cost of owning a home is so much less there. Uh-huh. Um, How much would it cost you to buy a home that you would really want for the long term, right? Because how old are you guys? Oh, I'm 50. I'll be 57 this year. My husband's turning 65. Okay. So. So, I mean, you want to make this house like a really friendly house to age in and you want to be in it for a while. And how much would you have to pay to be in a house like that? You know, we've been looking. It's probably between 350 and 380 okay. you know, somewhere in that range. Gotcha. Okay. And um, 
Interesting. So I guess the question you're you're wondering is how much of this money that you have of liquid assets, which is, let's say, 400 from the investment stuff and then 200 from the house sale, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, how much should you put down on a home in, in mm-hmm. East? So can I ask a dumb question? Have you priced out what it would look like to rent in Eastern Washington State? Well, it just it, we can't really find the type of house. Mm, okay, um, understood. Is up for rent. Okay, so. I got gotcha. you. Um, could you? All right, could you actually qualify for a mortgage because you don't have income? Um, that is another good question. I have an appointment with the financial advisor for that, or excuse me, a mortgage person to mm-hmm. ask that question. Mm-hmm. I've not done that yet. So, I mean, it uh-huh. may be that you don't have a huge choice in this. And and that's a little bit scary for me as listening to your story, because I, okay, ideally what I think I'd want to happen is that you would preserve as much of your liquidity as you possibly could. But I don't know if that's going to happen for you. Um, so, Tell you what, I got to go to a break. Let's come back and let's talk this through a little bit more about what some other options are. And then um, and then I'll give you some homework and we'll see what makes sense for you, because I think that, you know, you have a good like, a you know, eight hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money. Right. But it's not a lot of money if three fifty is going to go out the window to go into a home. So I want to let's talk this through. Uh, You're listening to Jill on Money, and the phone number here is 855-411-JILL. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com, and we will be right back to talk Lisa through her options. Stay tuned. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, she's all over the place. Go to JillOnMoney.com to find it all. Now back to the show with Jill Schlesinger. All righty, you're back with Jill on Money. This is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. Before we went to the break, we were on the line with Lisa, who um, I have to say just totally reminds me of a number of stories I've heard recently about people who have really needed to retire early in order to take care of their aging parents. Lisa and her husband did that and they've been doing so for the last uh, four years I think you said Um, and uh, as a result now uh, both of her parents have sadly passed away and now she's looking at what her next steps are. So, Lisa, before we went to break, we talked about that you wanted to make a move and buy something for three hundred fifty or three hundred eighty thousand dollars. You've got investments of uh, six hundred thousand or so, though. Uh, on, let's say about four hundred of that is more liquid, not retirement, and another two hundred coming in from a home sale of your parents' home. So, I guess I'm a little, I'm concerned that. Let's say you were to plop down three hundred fifty grand for a new house, that that really eats into your total investments. And then, you know, you don't have a lot of squish room here. So, you know, you have your you have your husband's Social Security's fourteen hundred dollars a month and you pay for your utilities and you pay for your life. How much do you think how much more money do you think you need on an ongoing basis? So let's let's like it's a new life. You guys have moved. It's no longer like taking care. But how much money do you think you need when we say utilities and food and fun and this and that? How much do you think you're spending? Twenty five hundred bucks a month? Yeah, I did a worksheet. It did come out to be about twenty eight hundred a month. Yeah. Okay. so we need to get you fourteen hundred dollars a month, essentially. Right. And Mm -hmm. what will your will your Social Security you going to claim on your own record or are you going to have to claim half of your husband's? Um, I'll claim on my own record. Okay. Do you have an estimate of what that would be? I think it's 17. Mm. No. Okay. That's yeah. good. I mean, that would be good. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So obviously, but you can't do that for a while because. 
you're young, which is, I mean, good. Is that your full retirement age? If, if that's um, 1,700, is that like, that's not at 62. That must be. Yeah, that, I, I don't, I mean, I believe that is the early number. Oh, okay. So if I All waited. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So here's the thing. Ideally, I wouldn't want you to put all this money down. I'm not sure you're going to have a choice because you don't have income. So um, I think that what you have to start looking at is um, you're, you're going to meet with a mortgage broker, tell the mortgage broker exactly what you've told me, what's going to happen, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, you may have to put make this be a cash purchase, in which case, you know, your nest egg is going to be a smaller one. Um, you're just going to be careful about the investment side and what you use to free up because, you know, use the proceeds from the house, the 200 grand. And then for the other 150, uh, is that money invested in mutual funds or stocks? Well, how is it invested right now? It's all over. It's, it's all over um, the place. Yes. yes. Hey, are you OK managing this yourself? Do you need to be talking to a certified financial planner? Um, I've actually been talking to one recently because the the stocks and things that were inherited, they're just still sitting there in the types of funds that dad had them in, and they're not the best. So I've been working with a financial planner to see if there's a way that we can make it more of an income producing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay. Um, um, well, listen, if, if you're talking to somebody, I think that's great. I think you're going to have to get a game plan together. I think that you're going to have to be careful about what you sell, make sure you don't have a tax liability. So I think all of this together really does argue that you have somebody you can talk to who's got your best interest primary first in front of his or hers or the company's. So just make sure that when you're talking to somebody that that person is a fiduciary, which means that Whoever you talk to, make sure it's not just a salesperson first, but an advice giver first. That's the most important thing that I think for you, okay? Okay. And uh, you can just ask. You can say to this person, hey, uh, are you are you held to the fiduciary standard, which is a very funny thing to ask because people would look at you like, how do you know that? How do you know that? How do you know that? And you say, well, I, I have a friend of mine in New York, and she's a certified financial planner. And then you just, her name is Jill. That's it. And no more than that. But the reason you want to ask that, and you know what, Mark, let's um, make sure to send Lisa the 10 questions to ask before you hire a financial advisor. Um, so that you have that in hand, because I want to make sure that someone doesn't just try to sell you a product with the money that's sitting in account. Instead, we really need someone to focus on what you need going forward to accomplish your goals. I think you're going to be okay. You know, your saving grace is you guys just don't spend a lot of money. And so in that case, it, it should work out fine. Um, we don't want you to spend too much of your of whatever's left over in those assets early on because it's all the money you have in the world. And if you want to go back to work because it's interesting, you or your husband, of course, the everything looks better when you go back to work simply because you don't have to dip into your nest egg to fund your day-to-day cash flow. So all that being said, I think you're okay. I'm very sorry you had to go through everything you've gone through. If your um, siblings are interested in in hearing why they should give you more money, I'm happy to have them call here. How's that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, I wish you that. I wish you the best of luck. And if you've got more questions after you meet, let me know. And uh, gosh, it's a lot to lot to take on the care of our ne- our older generation. And it's a it's really you can see it can be devastating depending on when people actually are have the calling to do that. You know, most people don't have the ability to just say, I'm quitting and I'm taking care of my parents. So it's pretty amazing. All right. You're listening to Jill on Money. Our phone number here is 855-411-JILL. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. We will be right back. Follow Jill on Twitter and Instagram for more personal finance content. Just use the handle at Jill on Money. Now, back to the show. All righty. You're listening to Jill on Money, and uh, we love hearing from you. The easiest way to get in touch with us is to send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Have you missed some of our previous episodes? Well, hop onto our newly redesigned website. Did you like the little edit I made today, uh, this week, Mark, on what I added there? I, every so often I look at the website myself and start making edits to things that Mark and the Mad Russian have done. 
Now the mad Russian asked me for investment advice. I got to give it to him no matter what. Uh, All right. Here's a note from James, who worked in a union for 33 years. He's been receiving a pension of sixty three thousand dollars a year or will receive uh, until he dies. Question. Is the pension considered income uh, that I have to pay tax on? I think I already paid tax on it since it was part of my wages for 33 years. I'm not sure how it works. I'm concerned this year because I was paid one hundred thousand dollars for a contract. Okay, here's the thing. Um, I think you probably do have to pay tax on that pension. You should go back to your union and ask them about the tax liability associated with the pension. If you were paid $100,000 that you don't know what to do with, maybe what you should do is try to take the $100,000 of income and reduce it by creating some sort of retirement plan. I don't know if it was earned income because it says for a contract for deed I had... Ah, this is, a, this is a hard one to read, Mark. I need your help. I'm not sure how you, he said he was paid $100,000 for a contract. I don't know if it was a contract like on a house or whether it's contract for earned income. If it's a contract on earned income, then you're going to open up a retirement plan and try to sock away as much money pre-tax. If it's a contract for some sort of transaction, like a real estate transaction, then you go back and make sure that you can try to raise the cost basis on what you uh, paid, maybe work done on the home, and reduce that tax liability. Either way, you've got some work to do here. I've given you some homework, James. So go back to the union and find out about the tax nature of pensions. They are usually taxable. And uh, maybe you want to talk to a certified financial planner or an accountant who can help you with your tax situation. Thank you very much for writing. This is Jill on Money. And when we return, we're going to have a really cool interview. Do you want to get to the heart at what's going on with the millennial generation? We are going to do that in hour number two. It's Jill on Money, 855-411-JILL, or send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. It's the weekend, and that can only mean one thing. You're listening to Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome back. It's hour number two of the Jill on Money show. What were you doing during the break? Were you going on to your favorite wagering website to make your Super Bowl bet? Mark? Big Super Bowl, one week away? One week or two weeks? Where am I? Lost my mind. One week away. And um, so who are you rooting for? You cannot be rooting for the Pats. No. Mark is too much of a New Yorker. I mean, they're really good. I have to say, I watched about five minutes of the game, the wrong five minutes of the game, the playoff game, the last five minutes, which was simply painful. We had a guest in here who was a Pats fan, and Mark says to him, are you worried about the Jaguars? Guy says, nah. I guess he should have been a little bit more than nah. Damn Brady, he is good. Right? I never rooted for Philly for anything, though. That's his, but it's not that much of a dilemma. It really isn't. Actually, I think that maybe I rooted, uh, rooted for Philly when um, Dr. J was on the Sixers. That's before you were born, I believe. Uh, I like Philly. I think Philly's a cool city. I just don't like their sports teams because they're, you know, they usually beat New York. <laughs> well, their fans are animals. I, that is, isn't it true that the Eagles had a, that the Philadelphia police had a precinct in the stadium? I think so. That was a long time ago. Anyway, this is a financial show. And if you've got a question, we'd love to hear from you. Our phone number here is 855-411-JILL. Our email address, askjill at jillonmoney.com. We've got a great guest. He's an author. His name is Malcolm Harris. He wrote a book called Kids These Days, Human Capital and the Making of Millennials. Do you want to crawl into the mind of the millennial generation? I've got the guy. Here's my interview with Malcolm Harris. So we start the show with a very important question. And I think it's going to be a... A fascinating one for you. I'm going to give you two choices. You're going to tell us the best either career decision or money decision you've ever made in your life, your young life. 
Well, my best career decision, I think, so far as I have one, uh, was moving to New York after college, which I did on a little bit of a whim. I had a one of those online writing jobs that paid me 1400 bucks a month but didn't care where I was. And you did it. And I did it. Yeah, on a, I was, what, 22 or something and didn't have anything else going on, so I moved to New York. Rocking. And so far, so good, right? Yeah. All well, those years later. Now I've now moved to Philly, which was maybe the best money decision I've ever made. Really? Was moving to Philadelphia. So Why are you living in Philadelphia? Uh, everything costs half as much. It's really... Uh, life is a lot less stressful in Philly compared to living in Brooklyn, Mm -hmm. which is kind of a lot. You feel like you're working all day just to have a place to sleep. And I like the vibe. That's cool. Um, I like Philly also. I'm also a big cheesesteak lover. So which cheesesteak would you be most partial to? Are you um, some sort of octo-vegan do-to-do? No, no. But if you go to Philly, they'll tell you that the sandwich, the, the real Philly sandwich is not the cheesesteak. That's the tourist sandwich. The real one is the roast pork provolone. Where's that? Now, you got to go to Frank's off Front Street if you want the real. Mark, we're there. Yeah. We're so totally that's, there. That, that's the real Philly sandwich. The cheesesteak, the... Cheesesteak spots are for the tourists. Those are the visiting dignitaries. So the official title of your book... Kids These Days, Human Capital and the Making of Millennials by Malcolm Harris, our guest, born 1988. Why did you want to write this book? Well, I started on the project in 2008 when the financial crisis hit. And I started thinking about how the I was in college at the time at the University of Maryland. And I was interested in how the same dynamics that had just collapsed the housing market seemed to apply to the student lending market. And so I started doing a lot of research into the student loan system, um, asset-backed derivatives, uh, financial products that were backed by student loans, and learned a lot about the system that people weren't really talking that much about. And the more I learned about that, the more I saw it as the central element in a larger structure that seemed to be generationally shifting. This was a new thing that people didn't really know about. And when you were thinking about that shift, how did you experience that shift? What was happening for you personally? And then how would you extrapolate it and tell tell us about the thesis of the book, which is, I, by the way, slightly depressing. I have to say, this is not like one of those books that you're going to feel great about, but it does help. I think you've done an amazing job of researching the shift and some of the factors that have led to the shift. So what is the shift and how did you experience it personally? If we do, The book starts back in elementary school. So you're looking at children growing up and how they're working in schools now. And people know, I think people, Americans have a good sense that childhood is different now than it was 30, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, on the way back uh, in America, and that kids are working a lot harder these days. And I went to school uh, in Palo Alto, California. It was a very competitive public school district. And I was was a National Merit Scholar and didn't finish in the top third of my class. What? In high school. Get out of here. So that's like the level of competition that we were dealing. I think I took like nine AP classes. I already, I did college in three years because I already did one in high school. But so when you think about that, like I guess that I'd always thought that, okay, it's funny how we frame things through our own lenses. I, before I read your book, if someone asked me about that, I would say, you know, I'm like, I'm a woman without a generation because I'm born <laughs> in a year that's like in between. But let's just say that I, I present more as a very young boomer or an old Gen Xer, okay? When I would think about that, like, why are they working so hard in mm-hmm. high school? Like, why are my nieces and nephews killing themselves and doing all this stuff? What I had thought bring into my own experience is that, oh, my crazy friends and siblings and in-laws, they're like professionalizing their students because, because why? Because it was a way that they could, I, th- I guess this is, was, again, my explanation was like they, they just needed to like put so much more into their kids because it was like the one thing they could control because mm-hmm. they themselves were out of control. But you come up with a different thesis, which is more... You have to be a professional student to get one of those coveted slots in university slash the economy. When did that start to shift? The early 80s, I think, uh, late 70s, early 80s is where we see the the trend lines start moving in that direction um, really hard. And then throughout the 90s and early 2000s, you see it really pick up. Yeah, it's been very 
very intense. The love, if you just look at the numbers in terms of the amount of hours and work every day that young people, the kids, children are putting into their future professional abilities, because that's how we're understanding education these days. That's how we're talking about it. You write, American kids and teens across race, gender, and class lines are spending less time doing things that make them happy, like self-directed play with their friends and eating pretty much the only two activities they report enjoying, and more time doing things that make them especially unhappy, like homework and listening to lectures. They're not having fun anymore. No, no, they're that's really... such a bummer. It is. Well, and it's a bummer both in terms of their day-to-day experience of being alive, which we'd like to think that children enjoy being alive and are getting a lot, of, a lot out of life, mm. but also in terms of the people and society that kind of training yields because um, they don't have the, the space to build community in the way that we'd like them to. Okay, we'll get back to our interview with Malcolm Harris in just a minute. If you've got a financial question, give us a call, 855-411-JILL. Send an email, ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Have a finance question? There are many ways to reach the show. You can call anytime at 855-411-JILL, send an email to askjill at jillonmoney.com, or tweet a question on Twitter using the handle at jillonmoney. Just use the hashtag AskJill. You're back with Jill on Money. So often we get questions about how to talk to your kids about money. And since many of you of our are of a certain age, an age to which I can relate, what you find is that uh, sometimes these kids have a slightly different outlook than we do. And, you know, I know that generationally every older generation looks down their nose at the younger one. It's happened, you know, forever. But this generation, the millennials, born roughly between 1980 and 2000, coming of age in the in the aughts, uh, does seem to have very specific differences. And uh, our guest today, Malcolm Harris, has written a fantastic book exploring those differences and what has shaped this generation. It's called Kids These Days, Human Capital and the Making of Millennials. And uh, it was it was actually eye opening to read this book for me. I learned a lot. So uh, let's go back to our interview with Malcolm in this segment. We're talking about the experience of millennials as they uh, head to college and what's going on there right now. What's the experience of the millennial in college these days? Well, the biggest shift since then was the kind of people going to college. And so there are still people who have that college experience. Mine wasn't even that different from, from what you described, probably. Uh, but we have a, a much broader swath of Americans, of young Americans, attending college these days. Uh, and they have, so now 70% of undergraduates uh, work part-time, at least 20 hours a week. Mm. And that's a that's a huge increase. It did not, it used to be college students just didn't work, almost never. Mm-hmm. And now what we're looking at is people who are not just living college, but college is one of the jobs they do. And they're and they're working because they've got to get themselves through college because we people like me say, oh, you need a college degree. You need a college degree. Why have the rewards not kept up? There's one very simple way to think about it, which is that when students are working, when they're working on their job skills, what they're producing is something called human capital. And basic supply and demand says if the supply of human capital goes up, the demand's going to go down. And that's what we've seen is you've got more skilled workers, which makes them cheaper. Mm. So we told individuals that, oh, if you go to school, if you learn how to do these skills, if you learn to code, language skills, whatever, you'll have these jobs available to you. You'll get a good job. But if enough people do that, if enough people says, okay, I'm going to learn to code, suddenly everybody knows how to code and coders are real cheap. And so... In fact, I mean, that does maybe help explain why wage gains, even in this recovery, have been kind of modest. I mean, you look at it. If exist, I mean, there was just a report from the EPI, from the Economic Policy Institute, calling it stagnation since 2000 to now in terms of median compensation. 
But that is median, and you say there are people who are kicking it, right? It's true. No, there are people who are doing great. They're mostly not, most of them are not being compensated by labor, the gains from capital. From... Mm-hmm. So you come in, so, okay, I go into the financial crisis, I have a job, and I've got money already, I have my house. Everything's cool. Uh, I don't lose my job, thankfully, in the recession. Things come back now. My house goes up in value, my stocks. Mm-hmm. I'm putting money into the market in my 401k. Everything gets great. But you're a millennial and you're starting from scratch. You're kind of screwed. Absolutely. Yeah. And we've seen the in terms of the recovery and since the crisis, we've really gone back to normal in a lot of ways. And, but the normal is not a great situation. The normal is what led to the crisis in the first place. So I was stuck on a bus recently. There you go. And I am reading your book. There is this chapter which really kind of stuck out for me, which it's called Work Sucks. (laughs) But you talk about something called the feminization of labor. And I found that really fascinating because you say that uh, women are actually better trained by society for the jobs that have been resistant to automation. But that feminization of labor is actually not good for everyone. It means that because, of course, women make whatever, 30 cents less on a dollar than a man. But how does that extrapolate to everyone? What's happening in the labor market that where you say that that the, the, the influx of women and their particular inclination in the, is valid in the market? And uh, well, I'm, uh, I think in that section, I'm quoting the feminist scholar Nina Power, who has a really great line and understanding about this. It's not she's not being a, an essentialist, a biological essentialist about women are better at talking or whatever. It's about how society trains you to behave. And one of the ways American society trains women to behave is to be very good listeners, very responsive, very communicative. And these are the qualities that the jobs that are resistant to automation demand. And so we've seen not only women entering the labor force, but what they call a feminization of male jobs as well, where you're doing more communication, you're being asked to understand people's feelings more, um, not just you know perform a manual task. Mm-hmm. Because those manual tasks are going to basically go away. Yeah, whether it's automation or offshoring, um, we've definitely seen that happen. So in your experience, you know, born 1988, full-fledged, card-carrying millennial, do you and your friends talk about this? Do you talk about things changing or are you just, you know, you're living it? How are real people talking about this? Oh, I think people talk about it all the time. It's uh, one of the reasons I wrote the book was to sort of give young people an example in the culture of a published work that sort of confirms what they've been thinking to themselves about their own life. You see it a lot and you hear it a lot from young people about just not complaining exactly, but an understanding that things are very bad. And you know what's weird? It's like the book kind of demystifies this notion of like, you know, your avocado toast eating, Mm -hmm. badge earning wimps, right? Right. Well, no millennial owns a trophy factory. You know, they talk about every millennial wants a trophy. We didn't get rich selling parents plastic trophies. Some boomer got rich convincing every other boomer Gen X parent that they needed to buy these plastic trophies. That had very little to do with us at all. Yeah, you were the recipient. So how is it that, you know, when you look through and you, so it is sobering, I have to say, because the statistics are sto- are sobering. The idea that, you know, of course, some of your cohorts are obviously doing incredibly well. There's someone who's in working at Facebook and Apple mm-hmm. and Google. but I was interesting. I was I interviewed a guy named Scott Galloway who wrote a book called The Four. It's about the the secret DNA of the four big tech firms, right? The GAFA. Uh huh. And so, one of the things he said was that I, I said, so you know, you don't really like these companies, but you know, if if someone is listening here and their kid gets a job at one of those companies, should they take it? He's like, oh my god, yeah, mm-hmm. because the riches are going to disproportionately to a narrower and narrower group of people. And you call that hoarding, right? The, 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 and and I'm, I'm interested in that. So do you have friends who are part of the hoarding class? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, and I'm, what industries are they in? I'm, uh, well, I'm Palo Alto High School class of 
07. So a lot of my graduating cohort are out there working for running those tech companies in Silicon Valley. That was sort of our local industry in a lot of ways. Do you think that it annoys the the majority of millennials when like people like me go out on CBS News and there's a jobs report and I'm like, tight labor market and 4% unemployment and lowest rate in 16 years. I mean, what does that feel like when you're the one who can't get a job and you really have done everything right? You've done everything that everyone told you to do would land you in a good position. Anyone even looking at it objectively would say those those metrics aren't working anymore. And we have this situation where the economy is so separate. The way we understand how it's doing is so separate from people's lives as they live them day to day. So the Dow is at an all-time high, profits are up, everything is going great. Well, without a framework that understands where those profits are coming from and at whose expense those profits are coming, you don't really have a good understanding of what a good economy means for people. We'll be back with our interview of Malcolm Harris, the author of Kids These Days. If you've got a financial question, give us a holler. Just send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. If you've missed any part of the show or want to check out a past show, go to JillOnMoney.com for more great personal finance content. Okay, you're back with Jill on Money, and we are talking to author Malcolm Harris. He is the author of Kids These Days, Human Capital and the Making of Millennials, he himself being a millennial, born 1988. And, uh, you know, in, in this interview, I think it's really important that we don't give short shrift to the unlucky nature of some of this generation born into a time where there was the greatest financial crisis since the Great Depression, and they have suffered, and they were just simply unlucky in many respects. In this segment, we're going to explore how we can help the generation succeed. So here's more about my interview with Malcolm Harris. What are some of the things that you think could happen to change the situation as it stands today? Well, the situation as it stands today is going to change one way or the other in, in that it's been changing rapidly. So if it stays the same, it still changes rapidly. So mm-hmm. there's there's very little danger of things not changing. The question is, how does it change in a way that is better for the working people of this country? And that's a real problem that people are are struggling with. The patterns are sort of set. Could you envision a time where things get so bad, where it's more like the late 60s and, you know, people are really it feels like, you know, like real social change is being demanded. And that is not just a march in Washington. That is sustained Mm -hmm. activity. Is this a generation that you think could do it? Like I was laughing because I was talking about the Women's March and I realized that my nieces and nephews, no one ever marched. We marched like every day in college Mm -hmm. about something. They didn't really know how to do that, but they know how to do it now. Right. Is that a possibility? Yeah, I think I think so, definitely. I, I think we, we are there. The difference is we've got a system of both private employers and the government that is better prepared to address these problems or control them, rather, not to, not to address them substantively. But it's, it's not going to look exactly like the 60s. It's going to be a little different. And when you think about your own future, would you describe yourself as an optimist or a pessimist generally? I'm an optimist. No uh, way. I am. No, Stop and no, it. No one believes me. Uh, and that's the response I've gotten from everyone I've talked to about the book. All the reviewers say, what a, what a pessimist. But I'm a, I'm a real optimist. Uh, but I, I try to be realistic about what that means. Mm-hmm. So what does that mean to you? An optimist for me means that... I don't think this social structure will hold. Uh, And I think that's going to be a disastrous process in a lot of ways. But I think that's ultimately a good thing because this is sort of the the end of the road. Like you say, I've got some 
stuff in the book about how it gets worse. But if we keep doing this, it gets really bad very, very quickly. And then the fever breaks? One way or the other, that's the question. I mean, look, this is a pretty... It's a bleak characterization of a large swath of young people. And when I talk to those people, am I ridiculous to start telling them to save for retirement because they barely have jobs? I mean, tell me, what what should I be doing that's better? What can I do to help? Um, yeah, I mean, as I'm sure they tell you, there were, I think there was, a, there was a viral tweet about this the other day that was telling people how much they should save of their income every decade. And there was a lot of funny millennial commentary about what you're supposed to save by the time you're 40 for retirement. Yeah, it does sound ridiculous. It sounds when people are struggling to get through the month, get through the year, and they're thinking about where they're going to live next year or next month, the idea of saving up tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars for retirement sometime in the future where they won't have to work, that sounds like a, a fairy tale. That's so it's so interesting because um, we talk to people all the time. They come here and they hawk their books and they say, well, you know, if you just talk to millennials in a way that they can hear it, they'll you'll break through. And you're saying that's baloney, essentially. Well, in terms of personal finance and saving. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not a mode of thinking that's very useful for young people in this particular situation, I don't think. Um, maybe some. I mean, there are obviously some. Right. Those are the outliers, though. But it is. It's, it's outlying. And so if people want to look after their personal finance, they need to start thinking a little outside the box and start thinking collectively, less individually, whereas the the system for how we talk about saving is very individualistic, with the exception of government programs. So... Total extra question in here. Given what you know and, um, you know, kind of the landscape, would that be an argument for a universal basic income structure where a lot of these people who have, like, really killed themselves to get to this place, who, as you say, are struggling, have some basic form of income so that they can support themselves? Yeah, I have a number of criticisms of uh, UBI or other guaranteed minimum income programs, but I think it would definitely still be a step in the good direction. I mean, any sort of addition to social provision that we've done would be hard to argue against for me, but it's also hard to see how it's going to happen. We started the show, I said, what's your best career decision, Mm -hmm. your best money decision? What's your worst? Ooh, my worst career and worst money decision. Either one. You don't have to do both. Well, objectively, I guess you'd have to say... Attending the University of Maryland was my worst money decision because of how college works. Mm. Um, If I could have gotten in somewhere better, uh, my money situation would probably be better. You think so? How much did it cost? Less. I I was on scholarship as well. Oh, Um, so? In some ways, that was a, a good money decision. Yeah. But if you look at, I mean, when I talk to my peers who went to Ivy League schools, they're living in sort of a different world. Then it is more like the job market you're talking about where you can just get a job, whereas people with public school diplomas uh, don't have that same access exactly. You're saying that that it's even more important to have some sort of calling card to get out of college with with an entry to the to this economy. Yeah. Well, and as as there are just more college graduates in general, um, some of the value of particular degrees goes up, and we've seen that. And the competition for those slots certainly has. Malcolm Harris, you didn't make me feel a lot better about this. <laughs> Sorry, Jill. I know, it's okay. But I really do appreciate it. The name of the book is called Kids These Days, Human Capital and the Making of Millennials. It will shift your entire lens around that generation. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thanks so much to Malcolm Harris for joining us today. His book, Kids These Days, Human Capital, and the Making of Millennials. When we return, more of your questions. If you'd like to reach us, 855-411-JILL. Send an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, she's all over the place. Go to JillOnMoney.com to find it all. Now back to the show with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. 
with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, I'd love to hear from you. You know, I just love really just to hear your stories and to understand what's going on in your own financial lives and how we can help you out. That's fantastic for us. Uh, You know, I am a CFP. I would say recovering CFP, but it's not really recovering. I loved being a CFP and I loved practicing. And now I love being a business analyst for CBS. But uh, it's really the interaction with you guys. It is it's quite amazing and it's it's very gratifying, I have to say. Both Mark and I have the sense that, you know, we're actually doing some good here. So love that. Uh, all right. If you want to get in touch with us, just shoot us an email. That really is the easiest way. And, you know, Mark will try to wrangle you to get you on the air. But ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. That is the address. Nora wants to know um, what happens to her grandson, who I think contributed uh, $1,000 to an IRA last year. Um because she says my grandson took out an uh, took out a IRA for a thousand dollars last year. I don't know what that means. I'm, if he contributed a thousand dollars to his IRA last year, fine, leave it alone. If he withdrew a thousand dollars from an IRA to help pay for college, then he has to make sure he complied with the rules around uh, pulling money out of an IRA to pay for education. So I don't know which it is. Mark and I are differing on this one. You think you think it's a. Uh, you think he just contributed money to an IRA. Is that what you think? That's how he read it. I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, here we go. Um, this is a question from Marianne about gift tax rules um, that we have uh, for coming up. Uh, because, uh, of course, everything changed now, right? IRS now has to actually comply with the new tax code so here's something interesting. Um, the The amount that you can give to anybody, that annual gift exclusion, um, I think that is now gone up to 15000 Mark, is that right? I think that is. I think I remember reading that. I'm pretty sure that. Double check that. Just do a fact check on that for me. Um, because that 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 would be a big change from 14 to 15. Um, the bigger change when it comes to your estate taxation is that an individual can shelter $11.2 million in assets from estate taxes. And so that would mean that if you're married, it's $22.4 million. And in a weird, you know, twist of fate, this would sunset. Uh, after the year 2025. If you're going to die, make sure that it's 2025. So that means that a lot of people are going to be escaping the estate taxation rules. Um, And Mark has just fact-checked me. It is $15,000 is your annual exclusion amount. Um, 14 always, like they didn't seem to move that any time with the why don't they just index it for inflation? I'm not sure. Anyway, so you can give 15 grand to anybody you want. You can leave 11.2 million to anybody you want, as long as your state doesn't levy an, a tax on top of that, which can happen sometimes until, especially until they harmonize their uh, their various rules with the new estate tax federal level changes. So. Um, and, and no, there is no change to the step up in cost basis, which is important because that means when you die, your heirs inherit the cost basis at the date of death, not what you paid. So you leave your kid a house and you die and the house is worth a million bucks. The kid in, inherits the house as if it were as if he inherited that house and the he paid a million dollars for it. That's his cost basis. It's not your cost basis. If you gift the house during your life, then the kid actually inherits your cost basis. It's one of the reasons that we actually really try to make sure that people don't gift homes during their lives unless they have gotten a lot of uh, wise counsel around that. So, uh, for 2018, Marianne, you can give 15 grand to whoever you want. There's no tax for the person receiving the gift. There's no tax for the person who gave the gift. 15 grand. 
So you want to give 15 grand to Mark? He's happy to help you out. Fantastic. Okay. That's it. 15 grand. All right. Lynn wants to know uh, if required minimum distributions exist for the government to garner money and are based on your age, what difference does it make if you're working at the same job or another or not? I don't know if I understand that question. Let me just think about that. Uh, What difference does it make if you're working or another? Well, the only thing that matters is that if you are working, you're currently working, then the government does not require you to take the distribution at age 70 and a half. If you're still employed, you don't have to take RMDs. Otherwise, you just have to. And there is no difference about um, where you're working. Um, and th- so, but it's the only rule on RMDs is that if you're working, you are not subject to the RMDs. All right. <sighs> I'm going to save this last one for the next segment, um, cause it's a little bit more complicated. All right. You're listening to Jill on money, 855-411-JILL. That is our phone number and our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Wondering how to make your money work for you? Get on the line now. 855-411-JILL. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. All right. Coming to the end of the program, got an interesting email from Lydia who uh, asked about a 401k. She writes, I unexpectedly got a refund from my 401k contributions in 2016 because my company's plan failed the IRS... ADP ACP tests. This is just uh, these are tests that the uh, that the government wants employers to run to make sure that your plans are not top heavy, meaning that they don't favor the bigger in earners in an organization. There are a lot of things companies can do. And in fact, Lydia says, I I understand why it happened. I I understand what my company, company could do. But if they don't do that, which they probably will. But what are my options for saving for retirement going forward? My husband and I make too much money for a Roth IRA. Any money I put in a regular IRA would be post-tax. That's okay. I mean, it's not the worst thing in the world to have have money in that account that is post-tax. I guess it depends on how old you are, how much money you've already saved, and whether or not it makes sense. If, For example, if you had saved tons and tons of money in that retirement account, and you've now fa- find yourself with extra money and you don't know what to do. Maybe, you know, if you're in your 50s and you're getting ready to look at retirement in the next 10 years, maybe you just open up a plain old general investment account. Maybe it's really that boring and you pay the tax due. Or maybe you throw the money into a non-deductible IRA and you do that for your 5,500 if you're under the age of 50, 6,500 if you are over and in the surplus you put into a general investment account. Either way, you know, Sometimes it, it feels kind of rotten, like, oh, this is unfair, this is that. But, you know, you're making money, you can save. It may not be the most tax efficient way to do it, but so be it. You're not going to have a lot of choice here. So, Lydia, I hope that helps you. Um, totally annoyed by the idea that, like, your company wouldn't comply with making this a uh, plan that passes muster. But that's it. You are not. You can't control that. All right, that is it, and it's another program that is in the can. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks to Mark Telercio for producing. And if you've got a financial question, anytime all week long, just shoot us an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. Don't forget to hop on our website, jillonmoney.com. It's redesigned and pretty, too. All right, we'll talk to you next week. It'll be Super Bowl weekend. woo All right, see you next week. <laughs> 